Good morning, friends. If I cannot see it, does it exist? Now, that's not the easiest question to answer, or perhaps it's not as easy to answer as it seems. I, I mean, the easy part is what we learn in infancy, right? Object permanence. That's where you discover that objects continue to exist even when you aren't looking at them. That's why peekaboo is so much fun to play with babies, because when you cover their eyes, they genuinely don't know if you're still there or not. Their brains haven't figured out object permanence yet, so for all they know, you just vanished. And at a certain stage, they, they learn that just covering your eyes doesn't, in fact, make the objects disappear, and then the game is really not much fun to play. Do you believe that radio waves exist? You can't see them at all. And yet, we communicate with them every day. In fact, there are radio waves at work right now facilitating me talking in the sanctuary and you getting to see and hear me at home. What about atoms? We can't see them, but we typically believe they exist. There may be a few atom deniers out there who are taking long walks on the beach hoping to run into a flat earther so they can settle down and live their lives together in bountiful ignorance. What about oxygen? We can't see it, but we believe it exists and we know we need it in our bodies in order to survive. Then why are we as humans so careless with deforestation? I mean, could it be that we believe in oxygen enough to breathe it, but not enough to collaborate on a global scale about trees? Or is it that we just think, well, that's someone else's problem. I mean, right here on my land, I've got enough air to breathe, even if I cut down those trees over there and put up my shed. I have no idea what global collaboration on air might look like, but it seems like something we should have been working on for a long time now, since we've known for a long time that we need oxygen to breathe and that photosynthesis is real and it's still the best way to produce oxygen. Okay, I did read enough this week to discover that we can manufacture oxygen using ultraviolet lasers and that there's currently enough oxygen in the atmosphere to last us a very, very long time. But I hope you see my point about seeing things and believing. Well, bless their hearts. The Israelites were having a really hard time with God. But let's think about it from their perspective, okay, for just a minute. This, this guy, Moses, that <clears throat> they don't really know, he grew up in Egypt, but, you know, he grew up in Pharaoh's house, so he's, he's not like us, right? And, and then he went away because he murdered someone, and then he came back, and he's claiming that God said he was our leader and we were supposed to be free, he performed some great plagues that brought about so much misery in Egypt that the Pharaoh told us to go away. And then the Pharaoh changed his mind when we made off with a bunch of loot. Okay, so we did walk through the Sea of Reeds on dry ground, and, and the Egyptians got stuck in the mud, and they all died. And we did see a cloud of smoke that we followed by day and a, a pillar of fire that we followed by night, but, well, I mean, to be honest, it seems like they're kind of leading us in circles, because we never seem to arrive at the place. Then we almost died of starvation, but we figured out we could eat the stuff on the ground that fell during the night, and, and then there were several swarms of quail that came into the camp, and we barbecued them, but Maybe that was all just a coincidence. I mean, none of us have ever seen this God that Moses and Aaron have been telling us about. What if God doesn't exist? And we're out here looking like a herd of fools. I mean, what if, what if Moses was just power hungry and he, he wanted his own nation to lead? He did grow up near power and... What if he got addicted to it? I mean, who wouldn't want to rule a nation? The Israelites, they can't see God. And Moses, 
who has been seeing God for them, in essence, has been gone for 40 days. That's a long time to just sit around and wait. I mean, what if Moses is a madman and he's just been making all this up? So the Israelites work themselves into a frenzy and in their anxiety about believing in something that they cannot see, they ask Aaron to make something for them that they can see. So the NRSV and several others translate this request, gods, in the plural. Come make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. But there are scholars who say this can just as legitimately be translated in the singular. So they might not be asking for gods to worship, but for a visible representation of God capital G, that they can follow. Now this makes sense to me, especially with what Aaron tells them after he's fashioned the golden calf out of their earrings and bracelets. He says, our NRSV translates, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Well, does Aaron suddenly believe that there was a plurality of gods working through Moses? Or is he telling the Israelites, here is your God? O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. That reading makes a lot more sense to me. The, the people were clamoring for something to help uh, steady their wobbly faith. We, we just need something that we can, we can tangibly see, and then we'll believe. That's not unique to the Israelites who were wandering in the wilderness, right? People ask Jesus, to show them a sign. And then they said, we'll believe. Jesus didn't do it. God isn't a parlor trick. And God won't use parlor tricks to try to coerce us into believing in God and having a relationship together. We're fighting similar battles right now on many different fronts. We have this novel coronavirus infecting millions of people and killing hundreds of thousands of us, but then some people get it and it affects them like a sinus infection or a bad case of the flu. Since there is no constant and predictable effect of the coronavirus on all of us different humans, everyone gets to point to the anecdotal evidence that they know and they can believe that more than whatever some nameless scientist has to say. And since this is a novel coronavirus, meaning a new one, our scientific community's knowledge about it and how it works and how it spreads and how it changes is ever increasing, which means we're still, we're still learning about it. And sometimes new learning produces new procedures and precautions and those who choose to can take that change as an indicator of ignorance or some weird conspiracy. We, we have just enough variables out there to give us all room to make up whatever story we want to believe. And that's made it very difficult for us to standardize our response to this threat. And you add to that the fact that trust in our leaders is basically non-existent and this is a real foot of the mountain kind of problem. What kind of golden calf are we waiting for to convince us that, that this virus is real and it will kill people that we love and we still don't know everything we need to know about it and ha to have concretized solutions, but the ones that we do have are based on our current knowledge and we'll change them if we learn something different. We're doing the same thing with racism in our country. You can't see racism, just like you can't see the hatred or the indifference in a person's heart. You can see the results of it, but we can't really see it, can we? So we have to take the word of our black sisters and brothers that they experience it. Just last week, after all of the discussions and the protests and the raised awareness that we've had over the last many, many months, a white police officer in Wolf City, Texas, responds to a call about a fight at a gas station. Witnesses say that there was a white man hitting a woman 
And Jonathan Price, who is a black man, intervened to help the woman, like you should. When the police officer arrived, the fight was over. Price approaches the officer and greeted him and extended his hand for a handshake. The officer assumed Price was intoxicated. And we don't know what else he assumed about the situation based on his bias. So he tries to arrest Price, who naturally protested. Jonathan starts to walk away, and the officer, the police officer, tases him. Well, he apparently turned around while he's being shocked by the taser and having involuntary muscle movements, and that's when the police officer shot him four times. Killed him right there on the scene. Oh, you know, though, he's just a bad apple. This doesn't mean that there's a system-wide problem. That's what a lot of white people say who don't support any kind of police reform. That's because they cannot see systemic racism at work in interactions with police. But if we would only listen to our black brothers and sisters, we would hear them tell story after story after story of unfair treatment by the police. Excessive force, unjustified stops, escalation without provocation. And now we're using police as the example, but it happens in every institution that we have. It's just that when black people are unjustly denied a loan, no one dies, so it doesn't make the news. When black people aren't hired because they're black, no one loses their life, and we don't hear about it. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Just because you can't see it in the interactions you have with various institutions doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Why don't more white people believe the testimony of our black neighbors? What, what kind of golden calf are we waiting on to convince us that this evil that began in slavery still exists in our society today? Well, Aaron either felt doubt overwhelming him too, or he was afraid of the crowd. Because as soon as they asked, he carved and fashioned for them an idol of gold in the shape of a calf. Think about how ridiculous that must have looked. I mean, even if Aaron was a gifted sculptor, he didn't have any modern tools to work with, and he, he made this thing, as the narrative tells it, it sounds like fairly quickly. I mean, who's to say? Maybe it was beautiful, but still, it was, it was a baby cow made of gold, and he told them, here's God who brought you out of Egypt. Tomorrow, we're going to party for the Lord loose translation and the Israelites went crazy they ate and they drank and they rose up to revel that's PG for what was actually happening okay imagine being God in this moment you brought these people out of bondage in Egypt after hearing their cries you had to perform several nasty miracles, including having every one of these ungrateful people walk through a sea on dry land that you then changed to consume the entire Egyptian army. You, you, you rained food down from heaven when they were fussy about being hungry. And now, these same people, your people, think they're worshiping you by getting drunk and offering sacrifices to a golden calf? I mean, you'd be mad too. And God says, look, I'm done. But we know Moses pleads on behalf of his people. God changes God's mind about annihilating these lost people. But why is this particular offense so egregious? Why were we commanded not to make any idols? I mean, you know, if you think about it, wouldn't it be nice to just have like a little figurine in your pocket? You know, just reach in and touch it, remind you that God is near. 
You know, what, what if when we're scared, we just pull out a little statue of God and hold it out in front of us to protect us the way they do with the cross in vampire movies? Wouldn't that be kind of nice? Just, just a little something to be able to touch and see. We've made millions of idols to try to meet this need that we all seem to share about the difficulty of believing in something that we cannot see. We often treat the cross as an idol. We Baptists have treated our Bibles as idols. We've destroyed fellowships across the country by fighting over our Bibles. We've clearly turned political power into an idol. Just a little golden calf worthy of our sacrifice and praise and compromise. We've turned money into an idol. We've turned success into an idol, right? We've used it as a symbol to know when God is near. Oh, this, this business transaction turned out better than I could have ever imagined, just like God planned. Or we say we followed God's lead and God has blessed us now with three more stores. Just little golden calves sneaking into our lives. Friends, God doesn't want us to settle. It breaks God's heart when we bow down and we change our lives because of a golden calf. When we could be in pursuit of a deeper and more fulfilling relationship with God Almighty. It seems ridiculous when we read about the Israelites doing it by the mountainside, right? But, but it makes perfect sense when we do it today. I mean, it just seems right to think that God, of course, loves the successful people more, and that's why they're successful. Just a little golden calf prancing across the stage somewhere, receiving award for the best whatever. Oh, God must be close to that person. You see how our idols divide us over God's love and affection. They're a wedge, not just between us and God, but between us and our sisters and brothers. It's so easy to settle for something that's tangible rather than holding out for a mystery. God will not be made into a mascot. God will not tolerate our giving in to something that we can see when boundless love awaits us. And the idols don't change the truth, right? I, I can't see ultraviolet light. You can't either. It's not just because I'm colorblind. So if I decide that, you know, I can't see it, so I don't believe in it, and I go outside without sunscreen and a hat, I'm still going to get sunburned. Even if I don't believe in that ultraviolet light exists. Clinging to and worshiping our idols doesn't change God's grace and mercy and power and presence. It just makes us fools because we've settled for something far less than the relationship that God wants to have with us. We've heard that so many times it can lose its power to overwhelm us, but God wants to have a relationship with us. With us. What are the idols in your life today? What are you living for and to what are you bowing down? Is it money? Is it the desire to be liked by others? Is it politics or power or the illusion of control? Is it a certain outcome on which you're waiting? Is it your health? Is it the health of someone you love? We all fashion them. Little golden calves upon which we hang our hopes and our faith. And God is calling us to look up. To see beyond the monuments 
and the tangible things and to stare into the cloud, to gaze into your own body where the Holy Spirit dwells, to see the very image of God in the people around you and put down your golden calves. Let go of the trinkets and fall into the mystery that is God's love and God's grace. Don't settle for anything less. Amen. Sisters and brothers, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the face of the risen Christ shine upon you and may the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit bring you peace. Amen.